Please open your Bibles with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. This morning we're going to begin the second half of Paul's letter to the Thessalonians, which may sound a little bit strange for a couple of reasons. Number one, Paul begins this section with, finally, <laughs> and it's chapter 4 out of 5, but if you're counting verses, chapters 1 through 3 total 43 verses, and chapters 4 and 5 total 46 verses. So this is really a halfway point in Paul's letter to the Thessalonians. And we're going to read verses 1 through 3, but just the first half of verse 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. This is the very word of God. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. And we'll pause there. To organize the sermon and our study of this text, we're going to move through three main points in our outline. Three main points as we study the Word of God here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And the first of those three points is this. Number one, the commands of Christ follow the cross of Christ. The commands of Christ follow the cross of Christ. Notice the way that Paul opens up this second half of his epistle, the second half of his letter. There's a a word of transition. He says, finally then. Maybe your translation says, finally, therefore. And I really want to be focusing on these words, finally then, or finally, therefore, because they're important. And they signal something to us. They're telling us something very important. They signal to us that what Paul is about to say is built upon what he has already said. Finally then, in other words, you have heard these things, now therefore, finally then. And this fits in with a pattern that Paul uses in his epistles. That pattern, to sum it up or to put it in our own words, is that first Paul tells us who we are in Christ, and then he tells us how to live in light of who we are in Jesus Christ which is to say that the commands of Jesus Christ follow from and follow after the cross of Jesus Christ. And so what I want to do under this heading is just establish that this is a pattern by reading various passages from the New Testament. So would you please turn with me to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. We're going to Cite, we're going to quote various verses that show the same pattern so that when we get to this in 1 Thessalonians 4, we say, okay, I understand what this is. I, I see here what Paul is doing. We're going to look at the very end of Romans chapter 11. And we will see that what Paul often does is he, he goes through a doctrinal exposition He concludes it with praise to God, a doxology, and then he transitions to a more practical section. Of course, all doctrine is practical because the practical section is built on the doctrinal section. Let's see that pattern work out in several instances. So first we'll read Romans 11 beginning in verse 36 and continuing into chapter 12. Paul has given 11 chapters, as we have it divided for us, explaining who we are in Jesus Christ and God's purposes of salvation, and he concludes with doxology. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Now, he he could just stop the epistle and just end there if, if that's all he wanted to do, but there's something that flows from this. Chapter 12. I appeal to you, therefore... In light of who you are in Jesus Christ, I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, 
that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So when Paul says in verse 1, I appeal to you, therefore, the therefore is there for a reason. It's there for a reason that there were 11 chapters of doctrine that preceded it. And on that basis, in light of your justification, Paul says, I appeal to you to live in this way, to say no to these things and to say yes to these things, to discern what is the will of God, what is good, what is acceptable, what is perfect. So the way that they live depends on who they are in Christ Jesus. Now turn with me to Ephesians 3. We just read this in our consecutive reading. Ephesians chapter 3, beginning in verse 20. Paul concludes with a doxology. Ephesians 1 through 3 are not as long as Romans 1 through 11, but they're so thick, aren't they? If you just take Ephesians 1 through 3 and just stretch them out a bit, you get Romans 1 through 11. And so at the end of Ephesians 3, just like the end of Romans 11, what does Paul do in verse 20? Doxology. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory. That's doxology. In the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Does he sign his name there and end the epistle? No. He says, next, I therefore, a prisoner for the Lord, urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Live in this way in light of who you are in Jesus Christ. First the cross, then the commands. Please turn to Colossians chapter 2. Look first at chapter 2, verse 16. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. Now, we're not going to get into the doctrine that preceded it, but there is doctrine that preceded it, who Christ is and what he has done in redemptive history. Therefore, let no one, therefore do not submit to certain things, which he says again in verse 20. Look at verse 20 of the same chapter. If with Christ you died, if this is true of you in Christ, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? And he goes on. So your identity in Christ dictates, it determines the way in which you live, or in these two verses, the way in which you don't live. Now look at chapter 3, verse 1 of Colossians. Chapter 3, verse 1. If then you have been raised with Christ, if you are in him, if you are united to Jesus Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. So we see this pattern in Paul's letters. Let's look at another one of Paul's letters, Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse 19. Again, quite a bit of exposition of who we are in Christ Jesus. If we have a perfect high priest who ever lives to make intercession for us, and by the power of his indestructible life we are brought once and for all into the Holy of Holies, therefore what? <laughs> Verse 19 of Hebrews 10, everything that's preceded it, we have a new covenant with better promises and a perfect priest. Therefore, brothers, this is verse 19 of Hebrews 10, therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain that is through his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, therefore, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. You see all the doctrine mixed in there. Okay, so let's see. Jesus has brought us into the heavenly holy places. Uh, we have a great priest over the house of God. He who promised is faithful. All of these things. Therefore, let us 
Be confident and draw near. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope, which is that Jesus died and rose again and is returning for us. These are all examples of a pattern where the scriptures teach us who we are in Jesus Christ and then they command us how to live in light of who we are. Now, you, if we wanted to add to this evidence, we certainly could by just reading 1 John, <laughs> all the chapters of 1 John, the entire letter, where John says, by this we know, by this we discern between the sons of God and the sons of Satan, the people of Christ and the people of the devil. If you are a son of God, if that's what's true about you, if you know the God who is light and the God who is love, then therefore you will walk in his light. You will keep his commandments. You will love his children and you will love his son. All of the the doctrine, God is love, God is light, God's children keep his commandments, God's children love each other, all of those are set down as non-negotiable absolutes of truth in light of which we live in a certain way. And John uses that to say, and therefore those who refuse that, those who reject that, those who won't walk in that way are not truly the children of God. So first we learn who we are in Christ. Then we learn his commands, because his commands follow his cross. Which is all to say that when we get to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, And Paul says, finally, therefore, I ask and urge you, we should have a little light go off, or a little, not an alarm, but a little little ding that says, hey, I know what this is. This is the same thing that Paul does elsewhere, that John does elsewhere, that Peter does in his epistles. This This is what the New Testament does. It tells me who I am in Christ, and then it commands me to live in light of that. Which brings us to our second main point in our outline, and we'll have several sub-points under this heading. First point was gathering evidence to prove this is the way that we are taught in the scriptures regarding who we are and how to live. Secondly, number two, the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ. The commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ. It's not just that they follow the cross of Christ, but the Bible makes this a necessary pattern. Let me give you six reasons why the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ. The first three come from our text, and the second three come from elsewhere in the scriptures. So number one, the first reason why the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ, number one, is that Paul says that it is necessary. Paul says that it is necessary. Where does he say that? It kind of doesn't seem like it, Pastor, because in verse 1, Paul says, we're back in 1 Thessalonians 4, Paul says, finally then, we ask and urge you. Mm -hmm. It doesn't sound very necessary. You you, you ask, may I please have extra sauce in the drive-thru? You may even urge them, I really want extra sauce but they may not give it to you. We may ask our parents, will you please let me stay up later? We may even urge them, I need to stay up later, but they may not let us. So when Paul says, we ask and urge you, why am I saying that there's a necessity? Isn't he kind of asking for their permission or just putting it in front of them for, for them to decide what to do? Well, no. Paul is speaking in an entreating way. He's appealing to them in a loving and gentle way, but he's not giving them an option. So where does he say that it is necessary? Well, look at verse 1 again. Paul says, We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Just as you are doing, do so more and more. The English word ought may not be strong enough in our minds to see what Paul is saying. In the Greek text, Paul says, as you, ref- as you received from us that it is necessary to walk and to please God, in that way, keep doing it, just as you are. Paul says it is necessary. And the English translation shows that with the word ought, but the word ought does not always carry in our minds the force and the strength that Paul is using here. You ought to walk, not should or shouldn't, but must. You must walk in this way, which pleases God, 
Paul is telling them, you have been doing that and you need to do it more. You should grow in this. So there is an, an oughtness. There is a necessity. There is an obligation. You ought to floss your teeth, but you must file your taxes. <laughs> Paul's not saying you ought to floss your teeth. He's saying you must do these things. It is necessary. It's a strong use. And so Paul's urging and exhorting and asking is telling them, is encouraging them to continue to walk in that necessary way. So Paul says it is necessary. The second thing that shows that the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ, number two, is Paul says Christ commands it. Christ commands it. Paul makes it clear that the commands he gives them do not originate with Paul. He's not the source. Who's, who's the author? Who is the authoritative one giving these commands? Verse 2, For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. The word instructions can be translated commands. I mean, an instruction is to do something. If you get a Lego set or an Ikea furniture set, it comes with instructions. They tell you do this and then do that and then do this. So these are commands. These are how you ought to live. They don't come from Paul originally. They come through Paul from the Lord Jesus. These are the commands of Jesus Christ. They are directives, instructions, mandates coming from their Lord and Savior. So it is necessary that they walk in this way. Jesus Christ commands that they walk in this way. Thirdly, the third reason from our text why the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ, number three, it is God's will. Verse three says, For this is the will of God, your sanctification. What is the will of God? The will of God means two things. It means what God will do. God will accomplish all his holy will. What God will do. And God's will is what he commands us to do. Sanctification is God's will in both senses. It is what he will accomplish in us. And it is what he commands us to do in our own lives. And so sanctification is God's plan. It is God's will. It is what he commands for us and what he intends to do on his part as well. If it is God's will that we be sanctified, that we put sin to death and pursue righteousness and holiness, and if Christ commands it, and if Paul says it is necessary that we walk in these ways, then we can conclude that it is necessary. The commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ. You don't get the cross without the commands. Well, let's look at more reasons from the scriptures. Number four, as we begin to look beyond our own text. Number four, the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ because sanctification follows justification. Because sanctification follows justification. Remember the distinction, the all-important distinction between justification and sanctification. Justification means that God forgives and accepts sinners as righteous through faith in Christ. So think about the parts of that answer to the children's catechism question. God forgives, he takes away our sin, and he accepts us as righteous through faith in Christ. We believe in Jesus. And by faith, we are justified. By faith, because we trust in Christ, our sins are forgiven. And Jesus Christ's obedience is attributed to us, so we are accounted righteous through faith. And this justification, our sins taken away, and Christ's obedience given to us, this is legal, and it is once and for all. By faith, we believe in Jesus, and we are justified then and there and forever. We are sinless from that perspective, forgiven. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That is justification. What follows from that? Those whom God has set apart for himself by giving to them faith and causing them to believe in his son because he's caused them to be born again. What does God do with those justified persons? Does he, 
simply leave his children to live how they want to live? No, because sin remains in them. Legally, their sins have been forgiven, but sin remains in them. And so it is God's will that they be made more and more holy. What is sanctification? The answer to the children's catechism question, sanctification, or in sanctification, God makes us more and more holy in heart and conduct. God makes us more and more holy. Can we be more and more forgiven or more and more justified? Well, no. God's forgiveness is perfect and Christ's obedience is perfect, so we're not going to be more and more justified. But can we obey more and disobey less? Yes. So we can grow and grow in holiness. We can grow and grow in sanctification, which is precisely what Paul is calling the Thessalonians to do. But the point we're making is that sanctification always follows justification. God does not justify a person without also then from that time on sanctify them. Everyone who is justified by faith presses on in that process and progress of sanctification. Now, we're going to look at sanctification in in more detail in future sermons. But for now, we're simply noting that there's a chain, there's a connection. Justification always necessarily leads to sanctification. And Paul calls them to grow and increase in their obedience to God because the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ. Fifthly, the fifth out of six reasons. We know that the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ. Fifthly, because faith without works is dead. Faith without works is dead. We are taught this in James chapter 2. True saving faith, the the faith that God grants to us, the faith that God gives to his children to believe in his son is a faith that works, a faith that strives to obey, a faith that strives to please God. And our faith is proved true. Our faith is demonstrated to be genuine through our obedience. James says that as the body without the soul is dead, it's just a body, it's not a living human being, so also faith without works is a dead faith. It's not a living faith. It's not a saving faith. And again, 1 John repeats that same truth, that you can't claim to know God, who is light and love, and walk in darkness and hatred. It's a contradiction. The commands of Christ must follow the cross of Christ. And sixthly and lastly, we know this to be so because, sixthly, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. The book of Hebrews tells us that without holiness, no one will see the Lord. God saves us from our sins, and he saves us unto obedience. He has predestined us for good works, Paul says in Ephesians. And he calls us into his heavenly kingdom of perfection. And the path to get there, the path on the way, is obedience. Paul has already said this in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Turn, look at verses 11 and 12 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul says, you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. The path to the kingdom and glory is a path of walking in a manner worthy of God. And that's the Christian life. That's the pilgrim's progress. Do we walk that perfectly? No, certainly not. We We veer, we divert, we go out of the way. But through God's word and his ministry of the word and the power of his spirit and the fellowship of the church, he restores us to that path and we keep walking. But those who will not walk the path of holiness, those who will not be restored, those who will not repent when called to repentance, they are saying, I will not walk the path of holiness, I will not walk the path of obedience. What do we say? Well, in the local church, we then have to excommunicate those persons, and we say, without holiness, no one will see the Lord. They are placing themselves on the side of Satan. They're saying, I will not walk the path to heaven that God has paved for me. 
So in conclusion of this point, we have three arguments from our text and three more arguments from elsewhere in the scriptures to prove that those whom God saves, he also sanctifies. Those whom God sets on his side by the cross, he commands those persons how to live in light of the cross. There is a necessity, a connection that we cannot undo or disconnect. Let's proceed to our third point before our final applications. Number three, the cross and commands of Christ are the heart of the Christian ministry. The cross and commands of Christ are the heart or the focus or the center of the Christian ministry. I want us to pay attention in our text to the way in which Paul speaks, the way he talks to the Thessalonians. He says in verse 1, Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you, in the Lord Jesus, that as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Jesus. Why should the Thessalonians bother to obey what Paul's telling them to do? Why should they care? Why should it have an influence and a pull on their hearts? Why should they conform their lives to chapters 4 and 5 of his letter, this second half of his letter? Because he urges them in the Lord Jesus with regard to the commands that have come from the Lord Jesus. Paul's ministry to the Thessalonians, what is the center of it? The Lord Jesus and his commands, the cross and commands of Jesus Christ. If you are urging and exhorting in the Lord Jesus or through the Lord Jesus, what kind of things can you say? If you qualify what you say to people with with that phrase, in the Lord Jesus or through the Lord Jesus, what things are you authorized to say? Well, it's a very limited amount of things, isn't it? It's about this amount of things <laughs> and nothing more. The minister and the ministry must focus on and derive authority from the cross of Christ and the commands of Christ. I can proclaim the cross of Christ in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I can proclaim the commands of Christ in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ because it is from Jesus Christ. But I can't give you my commands and my cleverness and then slap Jesus' name on it and expect anyone to obey it. I can't give you my life stories as motivation. Well, I did this, so you should do that. (laughs) I mean, you can, if you want to, you can thumb your nose at me. You can say, that's nice, Pastor Renahan, but that doesn't apply to me. You can't say that in the name of the Lord Jesus. Every minister must have this mindset I preach the cross of Christ and the commands of Christ. What else can I press the conscience of the sheep with? Next Sunday, I want everyone here in red shirts and red dresses, and that's it. And if you don't, you're in sin. Next week, no one should come in red, just to prove the point. I could never bind your conscience to do that. But let's be honest that it does happen a lot in our day in many churches where people's consciences are obligated to things that have nothing to do with the cross and commands of Jesus Christ. We proclaim Christ and him crucified, and then in light of that, how we ought to live. And then, finally then, and then, since therefore, if you have, then live like this. And we are faithful as ministers when we do so. And you as hearers should attune your ears, sensitize your ears to Christ and his commands. This is my diet, Christ and his commands. Tell me about my Savior, who I am in him, and how I may live and must live to serve him and love him all my days. And show me how, he, how we got to this. How did we get to the cross? Remember what Paul, we read in Ephesians 3 this morning. Paul says, I delight 
He says, I love to teach the mystery of Christ that was hidden for ages but now revealed that the entire Old Testament and the history of the world was always leading up to Jesus Christ redeeming a people for himself from all people's tongues, languages, and nations. Tell me about how we got to the cross and who I am in the cross and how may I live in the cross and the perfections of God that guarantee these things to me. That is what we are listening for. That is what we need to be fed. And this is what Paul was careful to do. We urge you and exhort you in the Lord Jesus the instructions that we received through the Lord Jesus. Well, how can we apply these things and conclude the sermon? Well, first, a doctrinal use. We're going to use this text doctrinally to understand a proper balance of the law and the gospel. We can establish a doctrine of a proper balance of the law and the gospel from this text. And that is simply to say, we come to Christ as sinners. We rest in and receive him by faith. And by that faith, we are justified. And then we live a life of gratitude and holiness on the way to heaven. We come as sinners. We are justified. As justified sinners, we live a life of gratitude and holiness. That is a doctrine. That is the truth. That is laid down, established, settled by this text. This brings us to a second use, a use of reproof. A reproof to those who teach an imbalance in the law and the gospel. Think about the word reproof just by way of clarification. I prove something or attempt to. What do you do to prove me wrong? You reproof me. <laughs> to reproof something is to demonstrate something to be false. I prove it, you reproof it. So, you first you have a doctrinal use positively, this is the truth. Reproof is this is not the truth. So we're, we're we are reproving an imbalance of the law and the gospel. For example, it's very popular in our days to emphasize grace and grace and grace and the gospel without an accompanying life of holiness. Now, why would I ever be opposed to the, the proclaiming, the, the scandalous proclaiming, in other words, the say it anywhere and everywhere proclaiming of God's grace? I would not ever be opposed to that and am not opposed to that. It's just that you can't proclaim the cross without the commands. And there are imbalances at times. Imbalances in literature. Imbalances in studies, study groups. Imbalances in music. Just be sensitive to that. Could, could I be overreacting to something? That's possible. But there are imbalances out there where we want grace and grace and grace and grace, and then we live in our sins because of this grace where I, I just want to hear about how all my sin goes away so that I can keep living in my sin. There's an imbalance there. But there's an oth another imbalance where you emphasize the commands without the cross. That's legalism. That's moralism. Faith without works, that was the previous one. Faith without works is not Christianity. But works without faith is not Christianity either. That's just moralism. It's just, here's a vaguely religious way to live that makes you feel nice and it's really just superstitious. If you proclaim commands without Christ, it's just the law. We need to preach the law in light of the gospel. And so we... Those who would imbalance the law and the gospel in these ways are reproved. They're proven to be in error in those things. And we ought to guard ourselves from such things with our children, with our Sunday school classes, with our sermons, with the books we read, with the studies, the Bible studies we attend or, or hold, with our own hearts. You keep them together, the law and the gospel, the cross and commands of Christ. A third use, a use of correction. This teaches us how not to live. 
And I want to correct here those who disregard the gospel and the law. Those who disregard the gospel and the law. The previous two deal with ideas, abstract ideas, doctrines. The idea of how to balance the law and gospel properly. Now I'm talking to real people living in real ways and doing certain things or not doing certain things. And there are some, there are many, there's the world that disregards the gospel and the law. There are those who do not believe. If this passage presses upon us who we are in Christ and therefore how then we ought to live, what about those who are not in Christ? What about those who have not yet come to him? What about those who cannot enter the Holy of Holies because they cannot enter through Christ and his flesh and blood? What is to become of them? Well, if you are not in the presence of God's blessedness, you will be in the presence of God's curse and judgment. So this corrects those who live with disregard for the gospel, who do not believe, who live in unbelief, who have not trusted in Jesus Christ for their salvation. You must understand the error. You must understand the peril. You must understand that it is sin not to believe. Unbelief was one of the main sins that Jesus accused the Jews of. You do not believe me. It also corrects those who claim to believe but walk in sin. Yes, well, I believe believe in Jesus. But their life entirely contradicts that profession. There are those who claim to believe but walk in sin and they need to be corrected. And if they will be restored, if they will be corrected, if they will repent, they are the children of God. And what what a glorious thing that they have been restored. But if there are those who claim to believe... But when accountability is applied to them, they persist in rejecting it and persist in rejecting God's law, then it proves that their their belief was false. The book of Acts says that Simon Magus also believed and was baptized. And then he tried to buy the Holy Spirit. And Paul says, you are false. You are still in the gall of bitterness So then, those who do not believe are corrected. And those who claim to believe but walk in sin are corrected. And fourthly and lastly, a use of training. This passage teaches us how to live. Not just how not to live in unbelief and disobedience, but how to live. And two simple things that should be exceedingly obvious by this point. Number one... Preach the gospel to yourself daily. Preach the gospel to yourself daily. Know who you are in Jesus Christ. Is your heart downcast? Are you discouraged? Are you doubtful? What will raise you up? What will encourage you? What will stabilize you? What will cause your heart to soar and to rise? Preach the gospel to yourself daily. What did we read in Hebrews 10? What is it that gives us confidence? Why did Paul say in Ephesians 3 that we have confidence and boldness? Well, in Hebrews chapter 10 and Ephesians 3, it's because of who Jesus is and what he has done for us and who we are in him. And so we need to preach the gospel to ourselves daily This is the obedience of Jesus Christ. This is Christ's keeping of the law. This is Christ dying for me. Oh, thank the Lord. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed say so. Let the redeemed say so every day. Let the redeemed wake up in the morning and say so. Let the redeemed close their eyes and put their heads on their pillows and say so. Preach the gospel to yourself daily and know who you are in Jesus Christ. And secondly, meditate on the law daily. Meditate on the law daily. Know what Christ has commanded you. We often have fear this is a common saying, we often have fear of things we don't know or don't understand. And sometimes all we have to do is 
push past that fear or that anxiety to find out what the thing is, and then the anxiety or the fear goes away. Let me give an example. I remember when I first started working in high school, and then I had to do my taxes. And it, it sounded like such a scary thing, and I guess it just gets scarier as life goes on. But, <laughs> but it can't, they can be done. There is a way to do them. But if you, have, if you have no clue what the instructions are, you just fear what they might be. You're anxious about the possibilities, but there's not possibilities. There's one way to do it, or there is a, a way you're supposed to do it. And once you learn that or begin to learn it, the anxiety begins to go away because you have knowledge and there's a path forward. Well, what if we treat Christ's laws that way? Well, I'm worried about messing up in the Christian life, so I'd rather just remain ignorant of the law. I'd rather just remain ignorant of Christ's commands and then I don't have to worry about them so much because I don't have to worry. I don't have to know I'm breaking them. So I don't want to hear about things that I'm not, things, ways in which I'm being disobedient. I don't want to hear about what are some of the common ones. I don't want to hear about the Lord's Day. I don't want to hear about church membership. I don't want to hear about giving to the church. I don't want to hear about faithful service in the church. I don't want to hear about how to love my spouse. I don't want to hear about how to raise my children. I don't want to hear about what kind of worker I should be. Okay, well then you get Ephesians 1 through 3 and that's it. And you get 1 Thessalonians 1 through, 1 through 3 and that's it. But you're excising, you're cutting off chapters 4 and 5. You're cutting off Ephesians chapters 4 through 6. And that's not Christianity. Meditate on the law daily. The law is good. The law is perfect. The law makes, makes the, 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 the mind wise. It enlightens. It refreshes. It restores. The commands of Christ... What does John say? The commands of God are not burdensome. And so if you have fear about, I don't want to know the commands lest I break them, well, you're already breaking them by doing that. As one so eloquently once said, stop it. And as you know those things, yes, you will break them. But there is forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And that's why Paul says to the Thessalonians, as you've been walking more and more, there's growth and progress and sanctification, but you can't grow if you don't know the commands, if you don't know the way. If someone says, this is the path, and you say, I don't want to know the path because I'm worried I might get off of it. Well, you'll, how would you ever even get on it? Meditate on the law daily. Preach the gospel to yourself. If you love knowing who you are in Christ, but you're afraid of knowing how to live in him, then there's an imbalance there. There's a problem. You need to know both. They go together. The cross, the commands of Christ follow the cross of Christ. And we've seen that the commands of Christ must follow the cross of Jesus Christ. And ultimately, such fears show a lack of faith. It has not God predestined us for good works? Has he not sealed us to the day of redemption? Has he not given us a new nature? Has he not indwelt us by his Holy Spirit? Is he not with us with his word? Has he left us wondering? Do we have to discover his commands in nature and listen for them in the wind? No. We need only to meditate upon the law and the gospel and give glory to God all the days of our lives. So I hope that this encourages you, brethren, to know who you are in Jesus Christ and to live based on who you are in Jesus Christ. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, once again, we render thanks to you for your great goodness to us, undeserving sinners, and pouring salvation out on us freely by your grace and mercy in and through Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. And with hearts thus filled with gratitude, we pray that you would help us to put sin to death and to serve you, to keep your commandments, to regard them as beautiful, to regard them as good, to regard them as health, to regard them as life, to regard them as the path to heaven. And please forgive us our many sins. Forgive us for not wanting to obey. Forgive us for, want, for not wanting to know your law. O oh Lord, correct our hearts and instruct us in righteousness, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.